Sorry. Hi, I'm Paloma Saha. Um, I will reiterate some thanks um, because this is the last panel and it is, I'm really the one feeling a lot of gratitude for uh, this whole event. Um, it's been, it's been sort of rapid fire. I, I don't know that I've ever felt two hours go by quite so fast. Um, and I think it really is a testament to Tharik and Nisraf um, and to Charles and Abhishek's engagement. Um, and so what we'll do is we will follow the standard format. I'll tell you a little bit about my own book, um, and then Julia Ryan Wilson and I will be in conversation. And then uh, we'll have a few minutes for Q&A for me in particular, but I'd like to then bring up Tharik and Nusrat uh, again and ask them to talk to me about what we are doing. If there's a collective project amongst us other than friendship, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and what that might be, um, what kinds of paths we are setting out on, um, and, uh, to, and then open it up to questions again. Um, so I'll start by saying that while I'm very happy uh, to be here speaking to a thing called New Directions in Bangladesh Studies, um, and I feel very lucky that when I arrived uh, at Berkeley six years ago, uh, it was the year that the Joe Gray Center for Bangladesh Studies was inaugurated, it felt like it was all here to welcome me. I don't think I've worked on Bangladesh studies, um, partly because I have a degree in English literature and it is somewhere impossible, or it would have been impossible, I think, when I finished my PhD, to have imagined writing a book about Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh is simply not an object of inquiry for the field of English. Um, and in some ways, that is the problem with which, uh, I, with which I began my book. Um, that I wanted to write about the question of post-colonial studies and what seemed to me a strange both preoccupation with Bengal um, and yet some elision that it took me quite a while to figure out what it was. Um, and the formulation I came to was a kind of, uh, on the one hand, synecdoche that has governed how we've thought about post-colonial studies for the last, I would say, 40 years in which India is the exemplar um, in some ways, of post-colonial politics, of modernity. Um, and that exemplar has been taken to task in some ways for its own preoccupation with Bengal, uh, partly because of the generation of scholars, many of whom themselves were Bengali, um, who inaugurated the field, uh, the sense that the field only could understand itself by way of Bengal. Um, and yet, it became very clear to me that that Bengal was not a single Bengal that in fact there are two Bengals at stake and when you think about the, these two Bengals, a very different form of post-coloniality emerges. <coughs> um, and so my book in some ways begins with the 1905 partition of uh, East and West Bengal, which is the first partition, a colonial partition that is only six years long. It's overturned in 1911, but it sets the stage for what I call uh, the kind of division of East and West Bengal into uh, one in which East Bengal inherits a legacy of material objects of Muslim labor um, and later becomes the object of inquiry for hard social scientists and for quantification data for development studies. Uh, and West Bengal, from which we inherit a legacy of politics, of literature, of history, um, which then of course becomes a part of India. And uh, when I set out to write this book in the colonial archives, I struggled with the fact that the Bengal I wanted to study seemed absent, and I found myself in Dhaka um, with other preoccupations, because to be in Dhaka and to be interested in uh, especially beautiful things is to be constantly encountering textiles. And so um, I, I thought these were two separate preoccupations, and they turned out to be one because uh, I began to think of an alternate history of political thought and feeling in East Bengal through textiles. Um, textiles not just as a metaphor uh, or even as a kind of material reference the way Gandhi imagines it uh, in the 1930s um, as a kind of purifying fabric, but actually thinking about textiles as a thing that bound people and bodies uh, and affects in a new way. Um, for example, I have a chapter in which uh, I think about Gandhi and Tagore's fight over what they both imagine to be form and function of post-colonial uh, of post-colonial politics prior to 1947. Um, and Gandhi is at this moment very invested in, um, in Kavi, in the spinning wheel, and there are those iconic photos of him at the spinning wheel, singularly <coughs> by himself, uh, spinning, though not weaving, 
doing women's work. Um, and he had this vision of a purifying fabric that would then clothe a, a nation that would be purified of the touch of Britain, except of course, anyone who wears clothes knows that, um, in fact, what fabric does is it encaptures as much as it releases. Um, and in fact, the kind of labors of making fabric were, for me, sites of accumulation um, and contact much more than purification. Um, and as I began to trace these, I found all of these other sites in which contact and accumulation seemed to be sites of political possibility. Uh, but they're political possibility that did not often give rise to the things that we think of under the sign of the political. Um, they did not give rise to uh, successful revolutions, as in the case of my first chapter, um, which thinks about the failed revolutionary violence of the 1930s. Um, they did not give rise to even successful, economically successful nation states. My latter two chapters think about uh, the economic problem of Bangladesh um, moving out of its uh, place as a site of uh, development politics towards uh, middle income status, which comes from garments work. Um, and so thinking about failure and contact, uh, I really found myself in some ways thinking a lot about what Bangladesh is, um, which is a site often, uh, as Nostrad pointed out today, of sort of the crowd of contact of politics that emerge um, and are at once overdetermined and yet constantly um, abundant and productive. Uh, and as Tharif points out, has a much longer economic and intellectual and social history. And so um, this book is a, is a strange one. It's not a history. It's not a literary study. It is uh, one that's taking up a set of, I hope, uh, provocative questions about how we can understand political labor, what its material objects are, um, and how else we might think about its memorialization if we don't turn to uh, the standard sites and methodologies that we've inherited through post-colonial studies of the archive, of historiography, um, of a history of West Bengal. So um, it is a book about the, the problem and productivity of East Bengal. Um, and I am delighted to get to talk to an art historian who works on textiles um, and a little bit terrified because now we are fully out of the realm of my comfort. <laughs> I'm, ready to, I'm ready to hear what you think. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much. I'm so honored that you thought of me to be in dialogue with you. And I think your book is absolutely brilliant and a real gift to many fields and makes a really striking intervention in um, not only in, in terms of um, textiles and textility. And I really wish I had had its example as I was finishing my own book on textiles and contingency and women's labor. I mean, there's definitely, there are profound affinities, I think, between our projects, and yet there's all, I mean, we all obviously have very different disciplinary formations, and I guess, I mean, I have so many questions here, we're not gonna be able to even begin to touch on some of them, but maybe let's talk about the question of discipline, because mm -hmm. that is something you just raised, and it, um, I think it, you, you're doing this incredibly masterful, um, nimble job of weaving together many different strands of inquiry, but I wanted to hear you say, in your own words, what are you doing here? <laughs> what is this? Uh, this is a very odd object. I mean, I love it. It's like an amazing, like, you know, super compelling, absolutely, you know, astonishing object of scholarship. And but I and I would I'd love to hear you say more about where you feel it, um, or, or the ways in the unruly ways in which it does not fit. I mean, some of the just to mention a few of the kind of objects of study here. You're looking at you know that traverse fact and fiction historical accounts, journalistic accounts, rumors of, of state archives that have been burned, oral histories, a series of objects um, that take on enormous significance for you um, that include Freud's ivory statue of Vishnu, you know, Gandhi's emaciated body next to his spinning wheel, photographs, you know, the men's clothing on the woman on a woman's burned body. And there's so many. It's such a it's such a promiscuous archive. Um, so I'd love to hear you speak about, you know, how you feel, you know, what, where, what is the nature of the interdisciplinarity that we're contending with here? Uh, that's a great question. Um, in some ways, I think Tharik offered a version of that answer with, uh, if I had not had the pressures of tenure and <laughs> having to write a book that would get published, um, actually, I would have done probably exactly this um, in some ways, because uh, one of the gifts of getting to be in a very large English department uh, 
which is itself promiscuous now as a discipline as they sort of take over more and more space, is um, no one seemed to tell me no. Uh, I was not able to study these objects or think about these things in that way. Um, and so I think taking on East Bengal as this uh, object of inquiry, and I call it in the book apparitional, um, because it is a thing that does and does not exist, and I hope we'll talk more about this at the end. Um, it appears in these moments that are of, of contingency, of urgency, um, in which there's a kind of rupturous announcement of something that I call often political, um, and it becomes a site of enormous affective um, charge. Uh, and the, those moments repeat, mm -hmm. uh, and it reappears in these kind of haunting, ghostly ways, but just as the spectral or the haunted is difficult to track, I found myself kind of liberated. So I figured if I was chasing ghosts, mm -hmm. I, there was no real methodology set for me. And I found myself um, able to uh, track down various preoccupations mm -hmm. that I draw together under a methodology that I call contingency, that um, I try to think of as um, a way to think about what might not be connected or might appear as coincidence, mm -hmm. um, but that for me feels like it has um, productive resonances. So for example, um, Rabindranath Tagore is the, the most famous mm -hmm. Bengali, perhaps. Uh, and he, in addition to this um, debate, this political debate with Gandhi over the what post-colonial nation might look like, and for him he's like, the nation, the nation will destroy us. We mm -hmm. have to move beyond the nation. We have to think in ca both deeply capacious global ways and then also live deeply local lives. Um, but he pens the, um, the anthem to two nation states, to Bangladesh and to India. Um, and what is always so curious to me is the way in which he is taken up as this founding father for both nations, but in such different incarnations. Um, and so, uh, in, you know, I had to take up this question of like how he appears and the ways in which uh, in 1971, for example, uh, to announce yourself to be sympathetic to the cause of Mukti Bahini, to the um, to uh, people who are fighting for Bangladesh independence, you would whistle um, a, a Tagore song. It could be any Tagore song, mm -hmm. but um, the to know the sound of Tagore's music was in some ways to announce yourself um, a particular person. Um, but he is also uh, a figure who's fraught. Um, in the ways in which he's been reincorporated into a Hindu nationalist idiom in India today. So um, as I track these people down, I just found myself throwing methods against the wall. And honestly, um, in the book, some work better than others. Mm -hmm. This is the, it is a book that is not united in its methodology. It is, um, for me, it was a very exciting endeavor mm -hmm. um, in terms of its interdisciplinarity, but it was precarious and it often felt, um, I would have, loved at moments to have better, clearer methodologies um, or a better script to follow. But I, I don't think that there is one for East Bengal. Um, I think now there are better ones because I have this set of compatriot books who have taken up similar or um, consonant questions, but I didn't have a great method. But I mean, it's super pleasurable to read as a result because you're, there's no dogma there. You know, no. there's not like there was because you're not following the script. I mean, you're really inventing, I think, a kind of hybrid, you know, you're really inventing your own path. And for me, that's one of the most exciting parts about reading this. But I would say, I mean, I will say that, you know, you are organizing, it does move, it doesn't move historically. You kind of go, you start somewhere and then you kind of go back and you kind of move forward. Uh, but basically, we're covering the sweep of the 20th century into the 21st. And there, it does organize itself around these objects or encounters or what you know, a web of relationality, which is how you approach um, objects. The people, and, and I want to talk to you about your relationship or non-relationship to what we would call new materialism. That's one question I have for you, because that's not really an evident framework for you here. And instead, what we have is a more, I mean, the people that you cite the most and I was tracking it really assiduously, and then I was like, oh, but there's also the index. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, how yeah, keeping like a sitting there, I was like, oh, I can just, there's this whole, this helpful tool called the index. I can that. So, um, CVX number one, um, followed by Marx and Derrida, who 
say yeah. equally. So that so that lays out a certain you know that I think traces some contours of your investments that are feminist, postcolonial, Marxist, you know, um, and queer also, which I think is importantly you're really resistant to certain reproductive. Not, um, there's, there's certain reproductive narratives that I think you're constantly refusing, which I think is really interesting. But let's talk a little bit about new materialism yeah. or, or its absence. Um, it's tricky uh, because it's a book about objects. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, for me, the, the fundamental barrier to new materialism is that the subjects that I am interested in, women mm -hmm. who do what I call political work in East Bengal, um, have not historically and do not now yet fully get to inhabit what we would think of as a full feature of subject of political subject. Mm -hmm. It is still so fraught. We can just look at the kind of debates over garments work and whether or not women are duped into their labor, whether they're victims of their own labor. And I think that when you already have the ways in which these women aren't given a full feature of subjectivity, I'm not yet willing to think about the subjecthood of objects mm -hmm. without them. I'm, st I'm, I'm a humanist um, in a really deep way, and I think that um, if I was thinking about a different place and time and had different human subjects, mm -hmm. new materialism has things that are compelling, but um, I think it, it works only when you can take for granted the question of the human mm -hmm. and the subject and the agential, and these women are, that's, part of the stakes of this book. It's part of actually why I start with Spivak mm -hmm. um, and her iconic uh, uh, account of human literary poverty in Tennis of Walsh and Speak. Um, and you know, she says, first, we cannot know, right? Mm -hmm. Subaltern cannot speak. And then she corrects herself. And this is why Spivak's a wonderful phantom interlocutor, mm -hmm. because she's constantly self-correcting. Um, but the question of whether or not you can know and how you can know the political desires of a woman who's nominated subaltern tracks throughout the book. <coughs> mm -hmm. And I think that um, if that is still the question in 2018 where the book ends, mm -hmm. um, I can't yet give way to the feeling and thoughts of fabrics. Right. Um, they right. can only be kind of repositories for human contact mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. human thought and human and politics. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Right. And I mean, I think your book is so um, smart about the idea of. Um, women as uh, articulate, or always the surplus around these resistant self-articulations. I mean, that's, that's one way that you put it. You know, that do, do escape kind of an ar uh, often the archive, you know, or do have escaped um, official histories, or that official histories haven't been interested in them. And that's one of the things you do, is want to return um, to some of these subjects, you know, a richer, more textured sense of kind of how they've lived their lives in search of, you know, some kind of what we could call freedom, you know? I mean, not that you would say, I mean, you do sort of, you do have word does come up. Freedom, I love freedom. It's, it's empowerment that I... Yeah, no, that, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 there's it's the yeah. empowerment. <laughs> yes, freedom. before freedom, <laughs> right. Um, so let's talk a bit about, I mean, so Spivak makes, it, you know, makes a lot of sense in this for, for sure. Marx, obviously, um, you know, is one of the very first people that you cite and for a book about, so much about labor, um, also makes a lot of sense. Of course, Marx's primary example of what, um, alienated labor looks like was precisely textile labor. Um, that's what the whole industrial revolution, of course, is, is like um, organized around. So let's talk about Derrida <laughs> as, as, as another central touchstone for you. Uh, Derrida is, a, he is, because of this question of haunting mm -hmm. and, and the apparitional, he is, um, and then I want to disappear him. Mm -hmm. Part of the, what, the reason <laughs> I want to disappear, disappear him is this question of language. Mm -hmm. um, which is important for the first half of the book. Mm -hmm. And I think it, the first half of the book is more Derridian um, because mm -hmm. it is actually the half of the book um, that is within the kind of ambit of post-colonial studies as mm -hmm. we have inherited it so far. Um, uh, it has the, the colonial archive, it has questions of, um, of political independence, it has um, the questions of of literature, I have mm -hmm. Tagore, I have you know some of the, the most canonical figures of uh, the post-colonial world. And in the latter half, where I turn to women, some of whom are alive um, and laboring, and for whom um, forms of articulation are not written or oral, um, Derrida becomes less and less useful to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that part of what you're noting is that the book has a kind of methodological shift in the, the two halves mm -hmm. um, in which the latter halves 
um, are much happier to stay with Marx mm -hmm. um, and give up on that inheritance of thinking about political legitimacy through language. Mm -hmm. um, well, it makes perfect sense. I mean, there's a way in which, as you note, and as many people who work on textiles note, there is a shared etymological root between textiles and um, text, uh, which is textera to weave. So to do the etymological work that you do do, which is very deep, you know, and, and becomes very profound in multiple languages, I will note, and it's very impressive, um, does start to do some of the work of disentangling some of these more veiled relations that I think you're really interested in getting at. So to me, the, I mean, to me, the deconstructive move, I mean, it's a kind of classic deconstructive move is to kind of like think back, think deeply about words and their significations and also, you know, what they all occlude. For me, was a, a really interesting thread, you know. But you do turn in the second half to surface more of your own bodily engagements with mm -hmm. these materials. So maybe talk about that because it's a different, almost you're inhabiting a different kind of authorial voice in that moment. Yeah. Where suddenly you're being served tea and cookies, you know, <laughs> tea and biscuits, <laughs> trying so to get access tea. to a non-existent, you know, archive. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, that the, the, the fourth chapter begins with me sitting, um, drinking tea, eating biscuits, ready to do the, the also laborious but strange work of, of the archive, of sitting, of reading, of, of touching. Um, and while that's failing, while I'm being refused access to this archive, I'm also, with the terror of tenure, uh, <laughs> spending time in garments factories mm -hmm. because I have this sense that I want to have a last chapter on contemporary garments work. Um, and there, my body is doing very different work. Um, I think of myself as a strong, able human. Uh, and in these factories, the, the question of labor and of, I, you know, I, I try to bring back the hand mm -hmm. uh, to ready-made manufacture uh, is so intense because my, you know, this work which you believe is machinic and no one really touches and really could be totally automated is in practice incredibly manual mm -hmm. um, and it's populated and um, that was so much about my body up against um, the women who are working on the line, you know, the ways in which, uh, unlike the kind of traditional Fordist model and the model that the factory is built on, one person rarely works on the machine by themselves. <coughs> it's actually just more productive to have multiple bodies working on one piece on one machine. Machines break down, they're put back together in um, these kind of amazing ad hoc ways, what the Hindi word is jugar, um, but there where bodies and you know people take off their, their urnas to tie something down and I was suddenly crowded, um, and I found as I went back to write, having to take myself out, um, and then finding that I left, I had left an imprint, and it had kind of left uh, an imprint on me. So um, those latter chapters are really a negotiation of my own presence, um, but also my own desire, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, so much of the chapter on the archives, looking for um, evidence of, or I don't know if it's evidence, looking for some trace of women who had been raped during the war and offered state compensation, um, and I was told over and over again that those records had been burned, I found myself um, kind of gripped and fascinated and having to navigate how I would encounter living beings. Would I ask them about their own, you know, uh, relationship to the war? Would I ask them what had happened to them? Would I, how would I touch them? How, these were, Suddenly, questions. I realized that people who you know have to get IRB clearance and <laughs> talk to human subjects all the time have to take on. But I was utterly unprepared for as a literary scholar. I you know it, I had no equipment for this, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's also where a kind of uh, theoretical apparatus failed me. Mm -hmm. um, I had at best my commitment to Freudian psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. which I don't know if it helped, but uh, it offered me some comfort. Um, mm -hmm. But it, you know, I, it became a, a very different project. And so trying to tie those two things mm -hmm. together is one of the challenges of the book, mm -hmm. for sure. I think, I mean, there, because, there's, because the idea of rumor becomes really important, and rumor as a kind of hinge between fact and fiction, or a, a, there's kind of the epistemology of the rumor here, that extends to your originary moment, which is about um, this Muslim doesn't exist anymore, you know, 
this gossamery muslin that is of such, I mean, there's this amazing, um, it was like 10,000 10, yards can be folded into a tiny no, box. Nine or, yards, nine, it's the length of a sari. Right, can be folded into a box this big, or, you know, mm -hmm. just the, the, it, this exquisite, the exquisite finery uh, of, the, of this cloth that no longer is manufactured um, that becomes its own kind of rumor. So maybe yeah. can you talk about the decision to begin there with this rumor of a fabric um, and how that kind of, I mean, things kind of spin out from there, you know, they sort of unspool in a way. I, I really love the, the, the textile metaphor you're going with. <laughs> in fact, I think as a, 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 a reviewer of the book was like, I don't know if all of these kind of like textile metaphors are working. Maybe you want to like. Oh my god, I got the same with my book. They're like, it's not a control. It's so irresistible. It's so irresistible. It's like, <laughs> um, I think metaphor is, like was invented to talk about textiles. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are so many, and they are so useful. They're so useful. Um, and they work. You know. Yeah. yeah. So Basically, actually, the the question of this spectral muslin. Yes. You should. Well, somebody should pose on Friday on Friday or Saturday because Shohid Alam, who's here, who's coming to give the lecture um, is the head of DRIC. And DRIC is this art agency in Bangladesh that in 2008 took on this project to bring back muslin. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a kind of fantastical project, literally, because um, it cannot be reproduced. Mm -hmm. And all we have are scraps and museum pieces and inherited pieces. Um, and the remarkable nature of muslin, which, you know, confounded imperial authorities. Mm -hmm. um, and John Forbes Watson, who writes the kind of grand compendium of textiles in India, is like, I, he watches, you know, they're watching it very closely because they're trying to reproduce mm -hmm. the, the methods in, uh, in Manchester. They're hoping that they can actually reproduce machinically this fabric. And he's like, I've seen it. I've seen, you know, the young girls spinning thread in the morning um, because it's so fine that you have to have it catch the dew in order to see it. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be invisible to the eye. Um, and he's, you know, he can record every step of the process. Um, and he looks at the final product and he says that it must have been made by fairies and insects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there seems to be a basic gap between the methods of its production uh, and the end product. Uh, and so 200 years later in Bangladesh, uh, at the same time, literally, of the Rana Plaza um, factory collapse, you have in Dhaka, um, scientists and historians and artists coming together to try and bring back the grand um, celebrated mm -hmm. imperial fabric. And I think it's so interesting that Darik begins his book with jute fiber um, and fabric because that is actually the other great imperial fabric that his is frankly not beautiful. It's not, mm -hmm. uh, it's not magical. It doesn't have this kind of mystique of the artisanal mm -hmm. and yet the ethereal um, and what Drick finds, and I kept going back, it was just repeated failure. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful. It's, I, I, I think I was perversely um, <laughs> and probably problematically excited every time they'd be like, can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> because for me, there is something actually wonderful about the inability to reproduce what is lost. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that like then the material trace can signify something else. Mm -hmm. um, if we can reproduce it, then um, it becomes something else. We have to give it another name. And in fact, the closest that they've come is um, using a nylon polyester uh, blend from Korea. Mm -hmm. um, it is the closest. Um, it gets to 1,800 thread count. Um, but only three yards, I believe, can fit into a shoebox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, if you think about the scale, yeah, this is, you know, um, though, of course, Drake is pretty quiet about it. Um, this is a multinational project. Mm -hmm. We have Indian um, scientists involved. Because, of course, the value of mm -hmm. muslin was not East Bengals alone, by no means, mm -hmm. right? I, I mean, I think, actually, a whole world would be very interested if we could bring back Takai muslin. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I was fascinated by this, and then I was also watching and living in my own clothed body um, the, you know, the factory collapse, mm -hmm. and thinking about what would happen if I thought about these two textiles, one so beloved that mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of dollars and so much labor and effort was going into bringing back a thing that was never going to come back, mm -hmm. um, and the very cheap, mundane, incredibly laborious, 
you know, cotton and um, knit, jersey mm -hmm. knit of ready-made garments. And, um, yeah, I, and I, I suppose with the, uh, the, the mystique of the muslin is that it was made by fairies or that it's at somehow absent of human labor. And then you put that so compellingly next to a quote-unquote ready-made garment that bears the label made in Bangladesh, which also, I think, in the imaginary is absent of human bodies yes. you know, or the laboring presence behind them. And so I think it's a really beautiful way to kind of bookend the, uh, um, a text that actually, you know, in which textiles actually do kind of float in and out. Uh, there's so many other things that go on there. There's so many other objects um, that you kind of train your gaze on. Um, but, but the ideas of touch, intimacy, of affect, you know, of labor, um, of kind of women's resistance, subjectivity are all, you know, they're all really present. You said you wanted to stop, but I, I do have two more questions. Yeah. Oh, okay, before that question. One of which is, I just thought, that there's all these kind of like, um, like, uh, I don't know, the word is, well, there's all these readings, I would call them readings, of like a, a photograph or of um, a, a, a passage from a book or of a documentary, of all the, you know, promiscuous objects that you, that you train your lens on. And they're very, you're very persistent. I mean, something I really admire about the book is that there's, not, there's nothing glancing. I mean, it's a, this is, the range of the book is really <laughs> astonishing. It's like broad, you know, much comes under the purview of this, of this text. But you really go deep when you have, when you have something, like when you're holding something in your hands, you know, to think about it, you go really, really deep. And one of those moments that to me is a kind of signature um, set piece almost of the entire book is about the fetish and about Tagore's notion of the fetish, next to Marxist idea of the fetish, next to Freud's idea of the fetish. And this triangulation, so fascinating. And is in the, well, I just want to hear you, for me, it felt like a kind of theoretical kernel of the entire text, because of course, the, because, and it, in a way, it was speaking back to new materialism, in a way, you know, because that is a different, that's a different toolkit in which to imbue objects with a kind of agency or power, and you're doing something really different. So maybe, like, tease that out for us. Yeah, I mean, so actually, um, the, the fetish chapter, I think you're absolutely right, it became a kind of moment where like a methodological clarity came mm -hmm. to me. Um, and it is, in some ways, the, you know, it's, so Tagore, in his debate with Gandhi, calls the nation a fetish. Mm -hmm. And he says, many things become a fetish, but he has a sort of sense that what the Gandhian project of spinning um, and of Kadi would do would to actually anesthetize and turn um, all of the people spinning mm -hmm. into just parts of a machine. Mm -hmm. So um, for, in the, which is a, obviously the opposite of what Gandhi's claim is, right? Gandhi believes that the act of spinning is making men. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, the fetish becomes a way to navigate this question of the anxiety that objects might have power over us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the end, part of why it becomes important to me is I end up disagreeing somewhere with both Gandhi mm -hmm. and Tagore because I find myself, and this is true through the book, of wanting to be enthralled by objects, of being willing to recognize where objects work on people, mm -hmm. perhaps because it seems like a way to navigate the life of an object without giving up fully to the new materialism, mm -hmm. mode, right? That it actually lets you think about um, the, the very porous border between mm -hmm. us and uh, especially objects that we wear, like textiles. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's this idea that I, I really found it hard to get over, and Chris Bailey come, you know, offers this reading of the work that a, a Bhobi, a person who washes, does. So mm -hmm. usually the Bhobis are of an untouchable caste, or they're Muslim. Uh, more often the case in East Bengal, where a lot of the labor of untouchability is actually taken up by Muslims. Um, and so the idea that, um, and you know, Gandhi talks about this great victorious moment where Tagore's niece wears a, a, a Kadi sari. Um, and this idea that even though his niece would have been Brahmo, she was an upper caste Hindu woman and she's wearing this Kadi uh, sari, which would have been sent out to be washed by probably a Muslim man. And the touch of his body on hers is unthinkable. Right beyond the pale, mm -hmm. um, the, you know the, the question of touch here is in a world where the interdiction of touch is religion, caste, gender. There's so many interdictions against it, um, but it would have been brought back to her, purified, mm -hmm. right, 
And yet it would have carried, especially because Kabi, in being so irregular, um, captures much more skin cells in mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. It's coarse, it actually rubs your skin. It would have carried his body back to her. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a moment to think about not recognizing that moment, the, that object as a fetish object, but doing the work of it was work. It would work on her mm -hmm. in a way that you know neither of these sort of um, theories of the post-colonial future mm -hmm. of Gandhi and Tagore could have accounted for. But seemed to me actually deeply intimate and deeply compelling, and in fact also materially true. Yeah. Right? Um, not just theoretical, but true that all of these people ended up wearing each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, not in a metaphorical way. way. Not, not, not in a fanciful way. way. In a way yeah. that actually undid, again, mm -hmm. to go back to this question of the subject, the fantasy of the sovereign mm -hmm. individual subject who will be the figure of politics. You're constantly undone because your skin is always rubbing up against mm -hmm. the remnants of someone else's body. Yeah. Um, and especially in a place as dense <laughs> as East Bengal, where you're never purified. And I think giving up on the project of politics as purifying um, seemed to be, seemed for me to be an incredibly compelling one that I wanted to trace out. Mm -hmm. I have one last question before, um, which I have to ask, which is, it's a textiles mm -hmm. question, and it's a feminist question, it's a queer question. Great. I would speculate okay. it's also a question about Bangladesh. Okay. Which is about your shirt. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, which has Bengal tigers. It does have Bengal tigers. <laughs> I've worked for you. I really have. I well, mean, I appreciate it 100% notice. <laughs> um, yes, but you know, this is actually, like, in fact, the perfect object because um, it is not made in Bangladesh. It does have Bengal tigers on it. Um, it is one of two such shirts with Bengal tigers I have on it. Mass manufactured uh -huh. by J. Crew, if anyone. <laughs> so, which actually, you know, the, the other the other fabric that I could have traced, which I didn't, um, which has a deep Bengal life, is silk. Mm -hmm. um, and the silkworms that are being bred in Rajchaki by Brack um, are actually uh, producing some of the most um, fine and tensile um, silk mm -hmm. fiber in the world now. Um, but yeah, no, I wore this because I. It seemed, I mean, I, I think that it was either this or I thought about wearing like an H and I'd have to go and buy an H and M t shirt, but I thought about wearing an H and M <laughs> yeah. t shirt yeah. as a kind of art object. Because it's very easy to call this an art object, mm -hmm. right? Or to be like, oh, it's so beautiful. But this is exactly the kind of negotiation with the objects of manufacture from Bangladesh that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Some get to be beautiful and high, like, and valued and commented upon in laudatory ways, and others are, you don't. I, you know, I had, I felt the need to tell you that I have to go to H&M. You know, of course, I don't shop. <laughs> this is about the value of objects. Mm -hmm. And what would it mean for me to think of a mundane, ubiquitous, cotton knit shirt as an art object? Mm -hmm. um, or as an object of aesthetic value um, that should be also then compensated in that way. And also should have the forms of historicization and memorialization that I'm happy to engage mm -hmm. with muslin or, or khadi, but, you know, I don't, I mean, there are people, there's the song of the shirt, which is actually a very interesting um, book, but there aren't a lot of people who want to write about mundane, though you do, this is mm -hmm. the thing, like you write about mundane objects mm -hmm. that, textile objects that are um, not um, high aesthetic, but mm -hmm. also do the work, mm -hmm. the real political work that like true aesthetic objects mm -hmm. do. Yeah, they are such a fascinating, you know, social membrane. So I, we, 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 we failed in our attempt to read a lot of written questions, but there is still time. Yes. So we can do a few minutes of questions just for me, and then I would love for Tharik and Nisrat to join me again. Yes, yes. Um, Julie, I'm so, so excited to read your book now. Um, I read before, but you didn't want to ask. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to ask in particular about um, the shift in methodology that you spoke about that happened somewhere in the middle of the book, in particular the move away from language and um, the political project, the sort of like language politics, I suppose. Um, but it seems to me such a radical departure, not only from the methodologies of post-colonial studies writ large, but <coughs> in particular in terms of Bangladesh, because the formation of the the narrative that Bangladesh has of, of itself is around language, language movement, a sort of language-based identity, um, and sort of like 
moving back into Bengali as opposed to Urdu, but sort of, I'm just wondering, and um, and maybe you've already answered this question, but, but, but what drives a desire to move away from language into the haptic or somatic and sort of tell stories this way rather than through language? Um, language doesn't disappear. Uh, it's, you know, and it's so, you're absolutely right that like the language movement, the question of a Bengali uh, ethno-linguistic nationalism is essential to the shift of the last two chapters which turn to a post-independence Bangladesh. Um, but in fact, I keep looking just behind you to Colleen, who's sitting there, because at some point uh, when I was revising the book, uh, she pointed out that there might be people who wanted to read the first half of the book and would be compelled by it, and there might be people who want to read the second half of the book and be compelled by it. But the question of how to write a book that people might want to read through all of it and be compelled by is a really, it's a, it's a difficult one, and it's one that I, I will leave it to you to decide if I can do that. But, um, I think that one of the ways in which I try to navigate this gap is to think about um, the, what other kinds of articulation um, are available. So our, the, and I turn to articulation not in like a Victorian mode, really, but to think about the, the broad range of the ways in which especially Bengali women seem to be quite insistently articulating commitments that moved beyond themselves, that were um, future-oriented, that were communitarian and relational. Um, and sometimes that happened in language. So um, song appears uh, in the latter chapters, you know. Um, the question of what happens to Tagore's Amar Shamir Bangla, why is it that the full song, which ends with a very political stanza um, in which this otherwise pastoral romantic uh, account of Bengal's mm -hmm you know, verdant pastures and raging rivers and banyan trees, um, then ends with a stanza where uh, the singer says, Mother, I won't buy um, gold ornaments from a stranger's house to put on your neck as a noose. Uh, and that is no longer a part of the national anthem. That stanza, which is a Shadashi um, political articulation about not buying foreign goods, is cut out in this new um, vision of Bengal. But, so there you have what can be sung together in a new Bangladesh. It's very different than what could have been sung together in the height of the Shadashi movement. So in some ways language appears um, and I think um, there's certainly, in some, the other thing is also though that I worried that uh, a preoccupation on language in those latter chapters would repeat this sense uh, that Bangladeshi women are always sort of silenced, right? Unable to speak their own desires, unable to um, say no to their own oppression. And I think I wanted to leave the realm of uh, language as the singular mode of politics because it seemed to repeat a violence that also was clearly not true. These women were constantly articulating incredibly um, powerful and clear intentions, um, just in a slightly different or you know, sometimes vastly different idiom. Mm -hmm. There are no more questions for me. I'm happy to be on the hot <laughs> method question. Oh, Lord, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it seems like the the, you know, you use the term promiscuous, which I completely, um, I, um, I like it. <laughs> um, uh, when it comes to archives. <laughs> I needed to clarify that. Um, but you know, it seems like you were saying that somehow uh, the dispersed nature of uh, things on the ground, whether they were available to you, whether they were, they were not, a kind of, um, informed the methodology. But what happened in the other direction, in the sense that the, the methodology that you actually ended up using um, in retrospect, do you think that actually generated something else or something different that probably wouldn't have been there if there were more of a particular disciplinary protocol? Yes. Um, one, I will say that I like the word promiscuous for all things. <laughs> no problem with that. Um, but uh, 
<laughs> yes, I think that in some ways, as terrifying as the moment of m the moment, months of going to the National Archives mm -hmm. and being told, come back again, mm -hmm. you know, and being utterly terrified that the book I planned to write was unwritable. Mm -hmm. um, that feeling notwithstanding, the, when I was allowed to think in new ways, when I was allowed to think about whether or not textiles might mm -hmm. be um, at first a kind of metaphorical um, referent and then became much more material, yeah, a whole host of new possibilities emerged. I found myself um, with a new archive that for me was incredibly compelling. So I spent, um, I found myself thinking about the work that Nukshigathas do, these are a very particular uh, referent of East Bengal, their form of quilting um, that uh, is utterly ubiquitous because it's layers and layers of used cotton, almost like usually saris, and originally the, even the thread that they were made with was pulled from old saris, so it was an entirely recycled object um, that all women did, um, and they are these remarkable sites of articulation where women um, embroidered particular designs or the sharing of designs, women uh, practiced literacy on them. Um, and suddenly thinking about those as a way to think about politics, um, it, yeah, it, it broadened my scope. Whereas if I had had, I think, um, if I had done a project on, <coughs> on West Bengal and I had met, had all my needs met by the British Library, um, as nice as it would have been sometimes, um, wouldn't have given me the sense of the range of political work that I got to encounter. Could I just add to that? Yeah. Some of the uh, kind of fears or anxieties that you mentioned about confronting just kind of unavailability, right? I think in, in certain ways, ethnographers confront this all the time, right? People never say the things you want them to say. <laughs> and most of the time, we change our projects in, in the field, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think my question about methodology was actually uh, kind of coming from that, whether there's a certain kind of um, open-endedness uh, that, um, that, uh, that is productive, but that maybe certain other disciplines um, have been kind of I've taken for granted for much mm -hmm. for a long time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. But I think that um, it's. I am now self-identified as easygoing. But <laughs> I, 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 I think the version of myself that started out on this project would have been incredibly grateful mm -hmm. for um, plentiful colonial archives mm -hmm. and clear methodology if I could have been satisfied by just reading literary texts, mm -hmm. I think back then I would have been very happy. Mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of um, flexibility you're describing mm -hmm. that ethnographers have, I admire, but I do not think mm -hmm. myself to be capable of, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is in some ways the best I could do with mm -hmm. my own range of what I could stretch. I'm sure there's another, there are, I know, other projects that could have Look like this that would have mm. been more mobile, um, but somewhere I am also hamstrung by, as promiscuous as my method methodology is, the limits of what I, mm -hmm. of how I can read, and I mm -hmm. that's all I can do is read, mm -hmm. um, in some ways. <laughs> <laughs>